ready for our big trip. Are you kidding? Definitely. Four days of fishing, sitting around the sun. Of course we are. Ooh. You know what? She's right about one thing. You are an asshole. Yes. Yes, I am. But I am a satisfied asshole. You know what? I gotta tell you, honestly, I am really, really enjoying this. That's because you're drinking. Well, I drink at home. I don't find this relaxing. Check your oil. Uh, no. Out into the woods? Yeah. Wouldn't you? Well, yeah, baby, but I'm a guy. I'll try to stand up. My name is Dante Saxon. My friend witnessed the murder 45 minutes ago. Some Herzog, my very special guest today is actor Joel D. Winecoop. What's up, Joel? Herzog, thank you. You're the first person, really, on the right off the bat, pronounced my name correctly. Very good, thank you. You're welcome, thank you. I mean, it, it, it took a lot of work, but I got it right. <laughs> yeah, all right, good job. Uh, thanks for coming on today. I want to thank you for contacting me last week to do this. You have a couple of movies that I haven't seen that I'm anxious to see. But if you want, we can start back to my, uh, my 80s horror days, back in the 80s. Um, the first one is called Twisted Illusions in 1985. Yeah, that one started it um, pretty much all for, uh, well, Tim Ritter and I uh, wrote, uh, he wrote three short stories and I wrote three. And we put them on to, uh, shot them all on video and uh, made up the name Twisted Illusions. And then put them on to, um, you know, VHS. There were no DVDs in those days. And uh, we actually went out and just kind of sold them in our cars and covered as much um, a territory as we could, going from West Palm Beach all the way down to Miami. And then another weekend we'd take West Palm Beach and go all the way up to um, Cape Canaveral. Nice. And no. tell them, I mean, tell them anywhere we could and every place we could. So now, so now, how did that turn out for you then by, by doing that? I mean, well, it's, it was, it, um, it's kind of funny because uh, we had met up with uh, a distributor. Well, that distributor was using another distributor's name, and I guess the original distributor was kind of ripping off the secondary distributor, and he was nice enough still, even though he was getting in trouble with the first distributor, to pass this on to the, to the second distributor, and that guy's the one that liked the Twisted Illusion story that Tim wrote called Truth of Dare. And they're the ones that financed us with a million dollars to budget uh, the, the feature film Truth of Dare, Critical Madness. Oh, nice. And the, who you're talking about is director Tim Ritter. And you mentioned it. We might as well go ahead and talk about it. The next film in 1886 was Truth or Dare, A Critical Madness. Yeah, that came from the Twisted Illusions had a short story. It was 20 minutes long. It was called Truth or Dare. And that's the one, the uh, Peerless Films out of Chicago, they liked it so much that they backed the um, Truth of Air Critical Madness. And then we were making this big movie where we were blowing up cars and blowing up, you know, shacks and crashing cars going over bridges at 65 miles an hour. So, big experience to be doing something like that, you know, at, at that time for me and for Tim. Right. And I'm telling you something, I'm going to try and find these because I'm a big 80s fan as it is. The next one was also in the 80s by Tim Ritter, Killing Spree in 1987. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. That basically was just an actor in that because Tim had kind of been writing that as he was doing Truth or Dare. And uh, he had been writing this, and all of a sudden he put the script together. He got a budget for it. And our uh, one of our co-partners at the time, Al Nicolosi, basically Tim and him, uh, Tim wrote the script, and Al was working on the... Uh, financial parts of it and such, and uh, Al drove up to my house one day and gave me a script, and he goes, there you go, he goes, uh, we want you to play the TV repairman, and, and a funny story behind it, too, because Tim always laughed at me, 
I had an agent in Fort Lauderdale at a place called Rising Star Agency, mm -hmm. and I told him about it, and he goes, well, you're not making any money on this, and I don't want to see you do it because it'll destroy your career. So I told Tim, I said, I don't know if I want to do it because my agent said that it'll, it'll destroy my career, and Tim laughed at me, and he goes, he goes, well, what a career? And I go, yeah, you're right, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Oh, you know, it, it's funny, you know, it's, yeah. I, I've been hearing them stories from a lot of people that I've talked to and interviewed in the past that says the same thing, but you know, but no one really knows if it's going to destroy a career or build a career, because I see, I know a lot of actors that got started in these super, super low budget movies, and they, and they became so much bigger now, I mean, you have to start somewhere, you know what I mean? Oh, absolutely, I'm sure they told Kevin Bacon, look, you better not do Friday the 13th, it'll destroy your career. Yeah, yeah he's really hurting now, ain't he? <laughs> <laughs> I want to tell you something, it's, it's funny you mentioned that, because every time I watch Friday the 13th, the first one, and I see him, the first thing I think of is Footloose, four years later. You know? It, yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's crazy. I know. Now the next I, one... You know what I really think it is, Red Dog, I think it's that, it's you can you can do something and go yeah that was dumb I'm not going to do it anymore I think it's the people that just no matter what you you just don't and I've seen a lot of other people that work at it for a little bit and then they're like oh screw this this sucks I'm not doing that again but I and I'm one of those guys and there's a bunch of people like me that have that you know you just keep going and that's the you keep on even though you know someone says ah oh, that sucks you keep on going you keep doing the next project anyway you you, you just don't give up and you don't you know let it you know, get you down. Yeah. You know, you just keep going. Well, it's exactly, you know, like 1980, you know, Friday the 13th came out, you know, and, and I, I've heard interviews from that movie from some cast members and stuff, and and people at the time thought, ah, uh, this thing ain't, ain't going to go nowhere. Now, think about it now. Friday the 13th is an iconic movie today. I mean, we're, we're talking 31 years later. Kevin yeah. Bacon is known for Footloose, of course, but he's also now known for a horror movie of Friday the 13th. So, you know, it, it benefits years years that go by. You benefit from it. Oh, absolutely. Same, I mean, same thing with Johnny Depp. Yeah. It was a Nightmare on Elm Street. And yep. Nightmare on Elm Street is still considered a low-budget movie, no matter what. And that's what people think when, and even some of these low-budget movies that got hit two, three million dollars, it's still a low-budget movie or, or, you know, whatever. I mean, but Nightmare on Elm Street is one of those cases, and then Johnny Depp was in it, and you think yeah. of, well, Johnny Jeff would never do anything like that. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> I want to tell you something. I'm a big, low-budget fan. I couldn't tell you when I watched a big-budget movie last. I, I couldn't tell you when, because I like the idea of independent, the low-budget. I like the idea of the creativity, and you, you go with what you have. And that's what makes a movie more interesting. You know? I, I, you know what? It's, it's, you're right. I mean, I can see... Because I talk to other people that say, you know, like, oh, I don't watch any big, big budget or, but, but I do. I, I, I like, of course, the big budget. But then I like the indies too. I just did a, um, I was the, uh, the master of ceremonies at a thing here in town called um, the Action Film Channel, the Action Film Challenge by Daniel Brianza, and I introduced every single um, movie that was played, little shorts, and I, I think there was at least thirty or forty of them because it went from nine in the morning till five and I introduced them all and uh, that there's so much talent and there's so many stories and, and all these things are cool and they're all in the you know in the low budget arena. It's just that everybody can't get a budget and everybody can't be making a big Independence Day movie. But and then it just goes back to who you're working with and, and what kind of story idea you got and what you can do with it. Right. And then mark it too. Right. Well I can tell you the last high budget movie that I've watched is probably The Crazies remake. Now, I really enjoyed that one. Now, yeah, that was cool. Yeah. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Oh, I thought I lost you there for a minute. <laughs> but, you know, I have Nightmare Elm Street remake here. I have not yet watched it yet, which I will eventually, but I have a lot of uh, independence that I want to watch and review first, but I'll get to it eventually. That's how I feel about, um, uh, it's a clear balance. It's like you got all these to get to. I mean, you can have so much, then it also goes upon how much time in the day do you have to watch 15 DVDs that are laying around and then do your your regular, right, right too. So kind of, you're kind of like having to balance it. 
Uh, last thing we went to see was um, Rise of the Planet of the Apes, and I, I, I by far thought that was the best movie I've seen in years. Uh, that was awesome. Yeah, I want to see that. I, I'm a yeah. big... <laughs> I can remember I was born in 68, so I grew up in the in 70s and, the, of course, the 80s and stuff. And I can remember watching the Planet of the Apes on TV, yeah. and I loved that freaking show. I loved yeah. it. Yeah, that was cool. That's when we moved from Minnesota to Lake Park, Florida. It was in the 70s, 72, and that was the big movie right then. It was all the Planet of the Apes. Right? The uh, guys that lived across the street from me, that's all they talked about. Oh, Planet of the Apes, and that's Dr. Zeiss, and that's Cornelius, and there's Zero, and, mm-hmm. you know, that, yeah, that was, man, that was the movie then. I know, and <laughs> yeah. one of the characters... One of the characters in Planet of the Apes that really creeped me out was Claude Aiken. He played the gorilla leader. Oh, that's right. He was uh, Colonel. I think it was a Colonel. Yeah, he was one of the ape leaders. You're right. Absolutely, and, Claude Aiken. That's right. And he used to creep me out every time I was a kid watching that. I don't know. But yeah. anyways, not to get off track, but there's a movie in 1994, also directed by the man Tim Ritter, is Wicked Games. Yes, Wicked Games. That was uh, Truth and Air Part Two. Okay. And that was that was um, that was cool because uh, you know of course it was a sequel. It was our first time doing a sequel. Um, well, I just have to say that, Sir Chuck. Uh, Lost Faith. When I was working on Killing Spree, I was writing the script for Lost Faith because I remember being down on the Killing Spree set one day, and one of the other guys on Killing Spree, the sound guy Scott Seed, he goes, "He goes, you guys are out of control. You're here making a movie." And you were on television last night talking about another movie you're doing. The Lost Faith was a, a martial arts comedy I had done. And I finished that and um, had the covers all made. Again, went around in my car from, uh, at the time I was in Fort Pierce, I drove from Fort Pierce to Miami. One day, sold as many copies as I could. Sold all over Fort Pierce, all over Port St. Lucie, all over Stewart. Then I would go to Fort Pierce on the road, went all the way to Cape Canaveral, sold everywhere in between. Uh, marketing was really good, but then I could do that stuff. Now I'm like, oh my god, where do I start? Right. But I marketed that thing so well that I made all my money back in like two weekends just driving around and sell it. And then I would tell the people, if you buy three or more copies from me, I'll make sure to mention your store in my newspaper article. All my articles came out the same day I was going to all those video stores. So when I was coming through the door, the people were going, my, where the hell have you been? We're waiting for that movie. Oh, you wow. are, you know, the bit to get it. So it's really cool. But then, yeah, right after that, Tim called me and he goes, are you all done with Lost Faith? And I go, yeah. And he goes, you sure? You sold it everywhere. You're not going anywhere on weekends. You completely sold out the movie. No more articles. No interviews. You're done. And I go, yeah, I'm done. What do you want? He goes, good, because we're starting Wicked Games, Truth at Air Part 2. And I go, oh, cool. Oh, wow. And um, I know Tim and I, we teamed up with Kermit Christman of the Shakespeare Festival down in um, uh, Jupiter, Florida. And, um, yeah, Tim had a real cool... uh, script with that, going back to the kind of the roots of Truth at Air with um, uh, Mike Strauber, the Copper Mask Killer, and this time it involved three Copper Mask Killers. Uh, uh, Kermit Kurtzman was one, I was one, and um, Kevin Scott Crawford was the other one, and it also had, um, I think that was the first time we worked with um, uh, Trish in Wicked Game, Patricia Paul, and also in Wicked Games, and yeah, that was just, that was really cool. Uh, so we had one, and this is where, where filmmakers can get discouraged and say, oh, man, I'm not doing that again. Tim and I, Tim got this camera from this camera company. It was like a prototype camera. Okay. Uh, it was a high eight camera, but one of the first ones to come out. Well, we only got half the movie finished before the camera started eating the tapes. Oh, geez. And we were like, oh, man. So Tim says, hey, we got to wait. We had to send the camera back, get another camera, and then the tapes were frayed and stuff, so we actually started over, shot the movie different, and that's why there's two versions of Wicked Games. There's the German version, which is the, the whole second run of the movie that we shot over again, and there's the American version, which is the original one we shot with, it had the little mix and stuff where the camera was eating the, uh, eating the tapes. Oh, wow. But first, yeah, yeah, so that was, it was an experience that, you know, we shot the movie once, and then came like, okay, we're going to shoot it over again, we'll just shoot it completely different. With this new camera, and, and that's why there's two versions. <laughs> that's sweet. I mean, it, it, it's it's so cool to hear stories like that because you know a lot of people don't understand that there's a lot of mishaps and there's, there's a lot of issues that's behind the scenes in making a movie. It just need to hear you know some weird weird stories like that. Well, I think that's kind of what um, because I think a lot of people go you know Tim has said this and 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 I say it too. Um, 
In fact, I know a couple of directors that, uh, Yale Wilson from Truth That Air, he used to say, he'd get us on the phone when we were shooting Truth That Air, and he goes, now who is this on the phone? Is this Joel or Tim? Because you both talk the same. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, uh, we said about, you know, stuff happening on, on sets and stuff. People sometimes will look at our movies and they'll go, oh, that's all. Awesome. I can do that with my camera. And our answer has always been, well, go ahead and do it. I want to see you try. Because it ain't as easy as it looks. Exactly. Everybody thinks that they just grab a camera and they go out and shoot it and okay, I'll market it. They have no idea, you know, that some of the things you go through as you're shooting, you have, you have actors that quit on you, you have actors that, you know, demand, I need bottles of scotch to be able to read my script correctly, and, and actors quit, and special effects break, and and uh, cameras break, and lights catch your gel on fire, and you get kicked off the property. You know, when people say, I can make them, please make it and show me. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is easy as you think. <laughs> Well, the next one is also a Tim Ritter film in 1995 called Creep, which I've yet to see this one. Yeah, Creep was, um, I just got to say a little thing about Writer's Block. That is actually another production company that wrote to us and they said, we want to use your name, Wicked Game, or we want to use, uh, or we want to call our movie Writer's Block, and we want to have your permission to call it Writer's Block Wicked, Wicked Game. Or, oh, yeah. No, Writer's Block, Truth and Air Part 2 is what they wanted to call it. Okay. So the unofficial, uh, Wicked Games is the official one. We just gave them our permission to do writer's block, and I've got scenes in that, too. But, yeah, when Creep came up, um, yeah, Tim just called me up, and he says, i got a new idea for a movie. Uh, it's going to be called Creep. I want you to play the lead again. Uh, your name is going to be Gus Finkelstein, and you're in an old barn, an old uh, broken-down barn. He's a serial killer. And uh, some parts of it I was, like, not excited about playing. I was like, Tim, you sure you want to do that? And he's like, hey, we got to do it. But then, in the middle of it all came, I guess something happened at Tim's apartment. He said as he was writing it, they got a rat infestation into his apartment, and he said he was going nuts killing these rats. See, here's another thing people don't know. These rats were making him crazy. He was killing them, and just problems at work, I think, and everything was mounting it up, and all of a sudden he just he exploded in this bit of rage, and instead of just, you know, they were carrying his apartment down. He put it all and focused it into Creep, and a completely new Creep came out of the uh, Gus Finkelstein Creep and became Angus Lynch. Then we had Kathy Willett, who was in the news, which we saw her in the news in 1992, and we, we kicked the idea around we should get her in one of our movies, and then we said, nah, she'd never have nothing to do with us. But as he was writing Creep and everything, the phone rang, and long story short, the guy was trying to disguise his voice, but it was Kathy's husband, Jeff, and he wanted to start Kathy on a movie career, and he wanted her to be in our movie. So Tim and I pulled together some money, uh, uh, wrote up some contracts, put Kathy in the movie. She became my sister, and that's what kind of spawned Creep. And it was really for uh, – it's funny, too, because uh, everything in nowadays is high def, and it's got to be so clear, and you have to be able to, like, look at the picture and stick your hand through there and touch people because that's how clear it is and it has to be. But in 1995, uh, we met up with a distributor, uh, Ron Bach, from Salt City Home Video, mm -hmm. which he's now Subarosa, but then he was Salt City. And he told us on the phone, he goes, this is one of the coolest, clearest, uh, neatest uh, horror epics I've ever seen. This movie, Creep, is awesome. And basically, it really, honestly, it was about that time, everybody was starting to, now things were catching on. Everybody was starting to make these movies. And and actually, we were Tim and I were credited for... Uh, Truth that Air being one of the first ones, you know, going directly to video, and that kind of started the craze. Well, by the time Creep came around, then everybody was starting to, they either been on board and were starting their stuff, but by the time Creep came, they they're really starting to put, you know, other movies out and their own movies out, which was sad for us, because the focus kind of lost attention on us, because it was going everywhere. I mean, right. everybody was starting to make these movies, which is good for everybody, but at the same time, you're thinking to yourself, like, oh, man, uh, if we could have been focused on a little longer, we maybe we would have got a little bigger, but Creep was was cool, because we put a lot of money into it, I think it was like 80000 which is not a lot, anybody else would laugh at that, but to me and to Tim, you know, this that was a big deal, and we're trying to put this money together, and same thing, you know, things, you know, happening on that, where people go, oh, I could make a movie, and you're like, the the, the Problems again, you know, with, with little things with Kathy Willis and and um, just shooting the thing and effects people and again different actors not showing up and you know and just little things like that. But 
Creek was awesome to make. It was a lot of fun. It was the first one where I was really treated like I was like, you know, a star or something. Tim would tell me, uh, Joel, we're not shooting your scene. If you want to take a nap of that in the hammock over there, I, I was always like, man, I'm always for naps. I would go take naps. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, man, yeah. So it was great. You know, I, I, I love doing that. And Tim would tell me, he goes, he goes, you know, I didn't want that in the scene, but I saw you were having so much fun. I just, I couldn't bear to tell you we're not going to do it that way. And then to this day, you know, I, I remember that. And I'll thank Tim. I'll say, you know, Tim, thanks for letting me do that. Was, if anybody's seen it, it's the scene where I stick my head in the jewelry case and the guy comes knocking on the window at the jewelry store and I'm robbing it and he's going, I want my, I want my, uh, I want my watch or his TV set. And I go, we're up and closed. I scream it at him. And, um, Tim was like, yeah, I didn't really want that, but you're having so much fun. But I think it's a funny scene in the movie. Right. Well, speaking of truth or dare, Let's go ahead and go to 1998, uh, Streaming for Sanity, Truth or Dare, Part 3. Yeah, that was a blast. Um, that was shortly after, um, see, once Creed came out, I kind of got, uh, uh, I don't want to say a following, but we had a lot of newspaper articles. Uh, we did a big story in Fangoria Magazine and posts from the underground, and that's pretty much, I think, where it took off for me, because then other filmmakers were noticing me, so I... I did um, Jack or Two Descent to Hell. I did that in New York City with uh, Phil Herman. I did Alien Agenda Out of the Darkness with uh, Kevin Lindemus out of New York. And then, as we finished those two up, we did um, An Endangered Species, actually. I think they're out of order, or at the same time. Um, but then, once Endangered Species was done, Tim said, okay, we're going to move from the sci-fi, which is Endangered Species, and we're going to go back into the horror. We're going to do part three to Truth and Air. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And he goes, I'm going to have you play the same role again as you did in Wicked Games. And you're going to play Dan Hess. And we even uh, had a flash. We had flashbacks from Truth of Air where my character in Truth of Air sitting at the desk, um, we said that we said that, that was going to be Dan Hess at a younger age working himself through college. Right. So it ties to part two and part three. And uh, part three was really cool. Uh, Tim wrote that. I think, um, I think Ron Bonk wrote a little bit that he sent to Tim and Kevin Lindemith, I know. Uh, contributed a little too, and he sent it to Tim. And of course, I just reprised my role as Dan has. And it was cool. It was about, um, it wasn't about Mike Strauber escaping. It was about another inmate in Sunnyvale Mental Institution that was close to Strauber. And he was the one that escaped, or another patient, and um, had been let go. And he actually dons the copper mask and goes on all these, these killings. And there's people out there that worship uh, Mike Strauber and it was just a real kind of cool different um, storytelling on it uh, it was uh, had a lot of fun to do uh, uh, I remember shooting one scene in West Palm Beach at Franklin Wales I was coming down the street with the copper mask uh, mask on and immediately the uh, the um, I forget what town was, the Lake Worth Police Department boom they nailed me right there with the machete and the mask and I had to take the mask off and Tim's running out he goes no no we're going to shoot it <laughs> Someone called it in. There's a madman walking down the street with a copper mask. And a <laughs> oh wow! Well, speaking of yeah, Dr. Doc- yeah. Speaking of Dr. Dan Hess, you also were in a movie in '98, Addicted to Murder, Tainted Blood. Yeah, uh, Tainted Blood was uh, Kevin Lindemann's movie, Addicted to Murder, Tainted Blood, and that's uh, the same thing from from those newspaper articles that all these other filmmakers were, you know, hearing about me and Tim and Tim for the directing and, and myself for the acting. Uh, Kevin Lindemith was doing that movie, Tain of Blood. And he goes, I really like that role in this, playing Dr. Dan Hess, you know, doing one of the uh, uh, speeches about um, about people, uh, the people that their minds are getting psychologically twisted up into thinking that they're vampires. So um, I did a little cameo appearance in that for Kevin, and then that, that actually was a lot of fun, too. That was very brief, but um, it's what Kevin wanted, and it was supposed to be, like I said, the, the movie's really cool. Um, and there's a focus part where they cut away to, like, doctors or, I don't know, these other educated people that would talk about psychology or, or people that might think they're vampires or are vampires, and that's the scene I did in that. That Dan Hess actually became kind of a popular character to the other filmmakers because I reprised Dan Hess in um, a movie with um, Ryan Cavallini uh, from Four Four Pictures. Right. And I think a couple times for him, and then a couple other people had me play Dan Hess. So it was kind of one of those characters that people, I guess, really liked, um, and they wanted to use that Dan Hess character again. People like Dan Hess. Well, 
1999, you have a movie here that you're in that I have yet to see it, but it has a catchy title, Dirty Cop, No Donut. Yeah. <laughs> Dirty Cop, No Donut was uh, shortly after we did uh, Streaming for Sanity, and, and I think it's, okay, I don't think it was the last movie Tim and I did, I think it was the second last movie we did together, and um, Tim called me up one night, and he goes, hey man, I got an idea for a movie, and I go, cool, what's what? what you know, what is it? And he goes, I want to do a movie kind of similar to Cops, where it's reality-based, but but it's not real, but we're going to shoot it reality-based, like a, kind of like a, a docudrama. And, uh, you know, and, and um, I was the one with uh, Danny uh, from the Partners family. Uh, he was in one called America's Deadliest Home Videos. Right. And I don't know how well that did, but, but Tim and I had, had copies of it, and we watched it, and we thought that was cool. And I think we kind of resorted, you know, or kind of looked back on that and said that they kind of did a little reality play, you know, you know, with the camera, going along with the people. And uh, so when we came around and Tim thought of this dirty cop idea, you know, kind of basing it loosely on cops on television, he said, this is what I want to do. And I was like, and it took me a while to understand because I was still like, even the first night of shooting, because you're not looking at the camera. I go, well, Tim, an actor never looks at the camera. He goes, no, you're missing the point, man. This is one where you do look at the camera, like cops. And then I was like, Oh, I got it. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we shot that on weekends. And basically, there was no script. What it was is uh, Tim would write down a kind of like bullet points. He'd go, okay, you're going to go to this, see this guy, and he's a child molester. So you're going to deal with him in the way, you know, psychotic guts with. Uh, here's the thing. You're going to pick pick up um, a hooker on the street, and you're going to deal her with her like, uh, like guts would. Um, here's a guy that's uh, uh, a drug dealer, and you're going to deal with him. So it was basically it was up to me. He just said, you know, just I just. In fact, I got a thing in the business now. A lot of people they just when I get on the set, a movie set or something, I'll do the script the way they want it. But if they know me, they go, okay, now do the other thing, and I'll go, well, what's the other thing? I mean, I, in the back of my mind, I know, but I don't want to like say it. But they'll go, do your wine coop thing, and I'll go, what? And I'll go, go wine coop, go wine coop on me. Uh, and that's a, like um, a guy I work for here in uh, St. Petersburg. Um, on his mo- on his movie, he goes he goes don't just do it like that. Go wine coop on it, and I go okay. And that and he means he wants me to explode and go out of control, and that's what I do. <laughs> and I always get like an applause. I always get the director clapping or something, saying, "Oh, that was great. That was cool." So um, for, for something like that, it, it was a, it was a lot of fun. And Dirty Cop No Donut, that's exactly what I got to do because Tim just said, "Just make the part of your own. This is what you're here for." You, you know, like the pawn shop one, he said, you're you're really pissed that this guy's selling, you know, all this uh, this stuff in his store that's all ripped off stuff. Act like if you could be that way. And that's basically what I did. I mean, the, the pawn shop was one where we set up a place to look like a pawn shop. It was uh, Tim Moffin from Action uh, Auto Salvage in Okeechobee, Okeechobee and uh, just destroyed computers and VCRs and and, you know, tipped over and was yelling at him, and he tried to bribe me, and he actually had the money from that day uh, sale. He had, like, four grand on him or something from that. He put, he hands it in my hand, he goes, here, you freaking hoinker, go away, and I take the money, and I throw it back in his face. And that movie was so fun to do because Tim just basically let me run it. I took a baseball bat to the car and totally destroyed it. And, Damn. And another thing, too, Tim would, it would uh, he'd say, you know, you go from point A to point B, there, there were no breaks, and he would just say, Okay, Joel, we're pulling this girl over for uh, uh, driving drunk. Just go from there. I'm just going to run the camera. And his wife played the uh, the uh, the perp, and I just knock on her door and say, you know, get out. You're drunk driving, and I find that, and she's like, oh, that's not mine. And she's a taser, and I just go nuts. And in fact, he told me, I go, Tim, I go, this is your wife. How do you want me to treat her? You go, treat her like any other actress. I go, but you know, and it's, I kind of like the uh, um, Kane Hodder thing. He, one of the actresses said when they were shooting prior to one of the Friday the 13th, she goes, well, he's so rough with me. And the guy goes, what do you expect? This is a horror movie. You're working with Kane Hodder. How do you expect to be treated? Well, so Tim told me, and I go, you sure? I said, because you know I really get into it. He goes, no, go ahead. He told me the next day, he goes, you. I go, what? He goes, you got to calm down. Kathy's black and blue all over her body. I'm like, well, I'm sorry, but you told me to treat her like any other actor. <laughs> oh my God! It's, it's, I heard it in Wicked Games too. Tim went to me. He goes, he goes, Joel. He goes, I'm telling you, man. He goes, those girls thought you were gonna kill them. 
They were so scared. Of, I mean, they knew I'm a nice guy and I could do anything to them. You know, but he goes, but you're so intense. When you get into a role, people don't know what you're going to do, and, and people are just really... I had, I had an editor in New York, uh, uh, two guys in New York are putting together a movie. One guy's editing it, and one guy's the other uh, is the, uh, you know, the creative behind it. And he went to the editor, and he goes, why are you spending so much time on Joel's scene? And the guy was going... He's going, oh, i got to make this perfect because Joel's a creep and he'll come up here and kill me. And the other individual goes, no, no, he's just an actor. He goes, no, I saw his movie Creep. He's really like that. If I don't do this just perfect, he's going to come up here and kill me. And so the director is telling the other guy, he goes, dude, he's just an actor. He's not going to hurt you. He's the nicest guy in the world. And he just, in no way, he would not go away from editing that. He goes, this has got to be perfect because Joel Weinkoop actually kills people and he will get on a plane, fly to New York and kill me if I do not edit this scene correctly. No. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, 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 it, when I hear that, when someone says that you're a sick, twisted, sick, twisted, whatever, I'm like, thanks a lot, because that's a compliment. But it, for me, when I got to do Dirty Cop, it was just, you know, it was just Tim let me completely go, just completely out of control in that, and it was a blast doing that movie. I loved doing Dirty Cop. It was great. Well, I did. It. I talked to uh, Marcus Koch um, after I reviewed 100 Tears. We had a couple conversations on the phone. And this movie keeps getting mentioned all the time. I have yet to see it. Apparently, it must be one of these iconic horror um, movies that, that people want to see, but it's called Rot in 1999. Yep, Rot was one of those that it was shortly after Creep. Uh, I was in Fangoria. And uh, Marcus had read that article, and him and his partner at the time, Lisa, he, um, she actually, I think Marcus, and i got to correct you, his name is Marcus Cook, it's pronounced Cook, like kiss the cook, Whoops. because I used to call him Cook all the time, and he goes, Joel, when are you going to learn to get my name right? And I go, I'm sorry, man. So he finally told me, he goes, it's Marcus Cook, and I go, okay. But everybody makes it, you know, because it looks like, it looks like Cook. But um, <laughs> anyway... Um, but yeah, he saw the article in Fangoria, called Tim, Tim goes, um, it was funny too, because it was a little play, you know, Tim's like, oh, I don't know, if I can get a hold of Joel, I'll do that for you. And then the next thing I know, I guess Tim called Marcus, gave him my number, Lisa called me, and she offered me the role as the Matt Doctor and Ron, and then Marcus called, of course, to close the deal, and we settled on a thing there, and, uh, and uh, the next thing I knew, I was driving over to Tampa, to um, shoot Rod. I think I went over the first time for four days and then um, shot all the scenes I had to. But Marcus had only written half the script. So I went back home and I think it was a couple months later Marcus called me up and goes, Troll, I need you to come back for another four days. And um, I go, okay, we worked out a deal on that and then I went back and finished it. And I will tell you, Rod was a lot of fun to do. It was a different... Um, medium for me to walk into because I'd mostly been working just with Tim and um, this is the first one I was just kind of going away to shoot something and it was just a whole different world when I got over to meet Marcus and <laughs> and all the people he, he was with at the time <laughs> and it was, just, it was just really different for me and uh, but, it, but, it, but it was a lot of fun I mean the people were really really nice and uh, I just got to tell this one funny story because it's just so funny it was like I got there, and uh, the first couple of days we didn't do anything, and I go, Marcus, are we ever going to get to shoot in this movie? And he goes, oh, yeah, but I was hoping you could help me move some furniture, and I'm going to go buy some stuff from my apartment, and I gotta, I'm going to go uh, down, i got to take this effects down to this church. And I was like, oh, okay. And then one day we finally got to the house where we were going to shoot, and he goes into this room, and he goes, this is where we're going to shoot, and there's a couch and a love seat and a table and books and rolls of carpet. I mean, huge rolls of carpet. You know, big rolls of carpet. <laughs> he goes, we're going to shoot in here. And I go, oh, with all the stuff in here? He goes, well, no. And the whole house is full of nine people are in the house, I'd say, in the living room, just hanging out. And he goes out and he goes, hey, Billy, can everybody come in here and help me clean this room out? Everybody got up and left the house. And Marcus looks at me and goes, Joel, can you help me clean all this out so we can shoot it? I go, yeah, man, where do you want me? I'll grab the end of this. You grab this. So me and Marcus cleaned out this entire room to shoot the movie in. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah, I just and then over the end, people go, oh, I could have done this. They don't know these experiences, nope. you know? No, they don't. It looks easy. <laughs> so we got it done, and it was a lot of fun, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't change anything. Marcus and I, I think, became 
you know, really good friends. We, we, you know, we've been working together since Ron. I, I met him doing Ron. In fact, we even had him come down and work for us with uh, Alien Gen Endangered Species. He's the one that built the alligator head for us. Oh, okay. So Mark and I, yeah, we became really good friends and still work on stuff today. But Rod was definitely, you know, a lot of fun to do. In fact, some of my reviews were wine coop overacts. And I, I told Marcus, I go, Marcus, this magazine saying I'm overacting. He goes, I'll, I'll, he goes, I'll stand up for you. And when Marcus had the interview, he goes, a lot of it, um, magazines are saying Joel overacts. He goes, but Joel did exactly what I told him to do. Because when I first went there, I started doing Robert Olson like like Angus. Because Marcus stopped me. And he goes, he goes, Joel, I gotta stop you a minute. And I go, no, Marcus, tell me what you want. And he goes, you're doing it too much like Angus. You gotta you gotta do it like this. Like I don't have to get out of control. And as soon as he said that, I had it. Right. And I did it. And he's jumping up and down, clapping his hands. And he goes, that's the way I want it done. And so <laughs> that's why Robert Olson is done overacted because Marcus told me to, and I think that makes the character more crazy that way. Wow. Well, if you want to, we can go back to Dirty Cop again. Uh, Dirty Cop 2, I Am a Pig in 2001. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dirty Cop 2 was, um, I shot my scenes in Florida, and Tim teamed up with Donald Farmer from, um, he worked with uh, Mary Finero in, uh, I can't remember if it was uh, Vampire's Kiss or, well, but Donald had done a whole bunch of movies too, and he was going to, with some acting, so he was going to play my cousin, I think, and I think Tim was supposed to be my brother that shot my video, so Tim teamed up with Donald, they shot a bunch of footage, and then myself and Bill Castanelli, um, who was our special effects guy on um, Creep, um, he was also in Dirty Cop, and in Dirty Cop 2, he plays my cameraman, and we shot a bunch of scenes here in Florida, well, I shot too much stuff. And I sent it to Tim, and he cut it together with Donald, and he released the movie, uh, Dirty Cop, No Donut, 2, I Am a Pig. And that was a movie where Donald and I were both in it. It would be, it started with, uh, I think, Donald's scenes where they were, and then it went to my scenes in Florida, and then back to Donald's, and back to mine. And it was supposed to lead up to Dirty Cop 3, where me and Donald meet up, but we never did do it. Well, then, I sent that in, and it was cool, but... I think Donald and I were both working at different acting frequencies, like mine was kind of way over the top, and Donald's is just kind of regular, which was fine, that's the way they were doing it, was, it was fine, but I, I think it was kind of an unbalanced, so what Tim did, he was Joel, what I'm going to do is take all your footage, cut it all together, and make a special edition out of it, called Dirty Cop 2 Special Edition, and so there's uh, Dirty Cop 2, I'm a Pig out, or Dirty Cop No Donut 2, I'm a Pig, and there's also Dirty Cop 2 Special Edition. Okay. So there's two different stories of it. But but they're both fun. Um, mine was, I went, like Tim would call me on the phone and he'd say, after he got my uh, footage, and he goes, you, there's no closing to it. You don't do anything to anybody. But mine was more like, I was going, I guess, for the comedy. And because I wasn't directly directed by Tim, I was kind of going on my own, I was making more of this kind of a comical pro, like my, my cop went in, took all the stuff out of the store and was drinking stuff and putting it back and eating chips and the guy was like don't eat my chips and put them back on the shelf and I was like just shut the hell up and run your business and then I try to rob him and he pulls a gun out and shoots at us and we run to the parking lot it was like the reverse of the first one right. he couldn't do anything without getting shot at or yelled at <laughs> so, yeah so to me it was more of a it was more of a kind of a dark comedy I mean and then we had we had scenes in there that uh, Tim's lawyer said, I'm telling you guys now, don't release that. You guys are going to end up in jail. Don't do that. So Tim was like, at the you know benefit of what the lawyer said, said, okay, we're never going to release that scene. We had two or three like that in our movies that we just said, you know, this isn't worth it. We're not big millionaires and stuff like that to take these big, the high risk chances. We're just two guys trying to make a fun movie and make people entertain, you know? Right. But that, that, that was a blast to do. Dirty Cop was a lot of fun, both of them. Well, I'm going to move up to 2004. It's also a sequel, uh, Twisted Illusions Part 2. Oh, yeah. So, yep. Yeah, it's funny because um, Tim and I said uh, way back in 1984 when we did the first one, before we actually released it, we put in the credits, coming soon, Twisted Illusions 2. And Tim and I always laughed about that because we were like, yeah, remember when we put Twisted Illusions 2 on the, on the end of Twisted Illusions and we never did it? And we'd always laugh about it. And we'd always say we should do that someday. 
Well, lo and behold, here it was 20 years later, and Tim goes, hey, man, do you want to do Twisted Illusions too? Yeah. And I go, I said, you want to do it just like we did the first one? No nudity, no swearing, like when we started out, we didn't do that. And he's like, yeah, man, he goes, we'll keep it just like we did in 1984. And I go, that would be cool. So, uh, um, I think was it? I think it was, uh, I think John Balker did a, a short story in that, and then Tim did one called Dexter Deadbeat, and I did one, um, my wife and I now, Kathy and I, did one called um, uh, The Part. Actually, I wrote The Part in 1984. It was supposed to be for the first one, but for some reason we didn't do it. So I thought, I'm just going to take that, the part that I wrote and, and uh, re-script it and uh, rewrite it and then do it in this one. And that was a lot of fun to do. I was um, man, taking equipment, uh, just, Tim and I always talk about how it's like, when he we were doing streaming for Sanity or Wicked Games, he'd show up at a car and be completely packed because we're doing all this ourselves. We don't have a crew. So, like when I did the part, I just packed up my car with, you know, lights and props and the trunk was full, the back seat, the front seat next to me. I could barely drive. I had so much crap in there. Driving up to actually, you know, put together and shoot the movie. And, and uh, again, those are the things that goes into that. You know, you, a lot of people think, well, I can do that. I'll get me a crew now. Do it by yourself. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but yeah, um, it was cool because it was a, it was a throwback to the actual the original Twisted Illusions we did back in 1984. So it was a lot of fun to do, and we can because I'd have people that would be like, you know, f this or f that. And I go, dude, you're, I, I don't want you to. Well, you, you don't swear. And I go, dude, it's not that. We're just trying to keep the same effect as we did in '84. Or well, one girl in Tim, she kept taking her clothes off and showing her breasts. She goes, how about that? Put these out there and Tim goes, uh, look, they're really nice, but that's not what we're trying to do here. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, you know, it was really cool uh, to be able to, uh, to kind of recreate it and keep it in that same era and everything. Well, in 2005, you directed one and written it with Phil Herman. It's called The Bite in 2005. Yeah, um... The bite, that's after I moved over to Tampa. Um, Phil Herman had sent me a uh, three-page synopsis, and he goes, can you make this movie? It's for it's going to be for the Always Midnight series. And uh, basically it was, this is the script for The Bite. Uh, and it wasn't called The Bite. Well, I think, I actually, I think it was called The Bite then. Um, a guy walks down the street, uh, sits down, remembers about his wife being bit by a vampire. The end. And I told Phil, I, you know, I started to write it, and I go, Phil, I, I can't just do a short like this. i got to... I gotta put more stuff into it. So I started writing and writing, and the next thing I know, I get a call from Phil, and he goes, "Joel, he goes, they're gonna get that to me. I needed it like yesterday." And I go, "I said, geez, Phil. I said, you know, I'm I'm always there for you. I said, but I'm not done yet." And I was really surprised because Phil was like, "Well, then I gotta, you know, get someone else to to do the short because I need it now." And I was like, "Oh, this, this is weird. My friend's firing me." <laughs> and I was like, "Okay, I owe you one." I said, "I tell you what, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna turn it into a movie, and I owe you one for the next one." And he goes, okay. So that's what I did. I went out and uh, wrote a 90-page script for the bite, and then I cast it for it. Uh, got a new cameraman because Tim was obviously away. I couldn't work with Tim. So I got a hold of a uh, guy I met and partnered up with him, Chris Conklin, and we made the movie The Bite. It was a martial arts, vampire, um, action-adventure thing about uh, kind of post-apocalyptic where this guy was in the future, and pretty much there were there were humans, you know. Did you see cars driving around and stuff? But a lot of the um, landscape was populated by vampires. Oh, wow. And my character was Nick Hazard, and he was trying to destroy all these vampires. And it was a lot of fun because uh, Tim's the one that told me. He goes, he goes, man, you haven't you haven't um, written anything in a long time, and you haven't started anything in a long time. You need to do something that's not a short, or people will forget about you. So, and that kind of pushed it for me. I said, well, that's when I said okay, I'm going to just make this bite into a big movie. And then shortly after that, I wrote Killer Arnold, which is a little 20-minute piece, and I gave that to Phil to put in um, uh, All These Midnight. All right. Well, in 2007, I wouldn't mind seeing this. It's called Day of the Axe. Day of the Axe is by Ryan Cavallini. That's one of those where I played play Dan has. He called me up, and again, same thing, he saw... Well, it's cool. He he had talked to Phil Herman. He goes, I really need a kind of a big actor to put in one of my movies. And Phil Herman was kind of playing a game. And he goes, well, I can get you, you know, what about Joel Wanakoop? 
And uh, Ryan Cavallini, I guess he grew up watching our movies when he was in college because later on in life he sent me a poster of Dirty Count No Dawn and he goes, Joel, this inspired me to make movies. He goes, because I had you in my dorm and all the other college guys would say, who's that one kid dude? And he goes, that's the guy that believes and, and knows about movies and I, that's what I want to do. So um, Day of the Axe was uh, Ryan's movie and uh, he wanted me to portray Dan Heston there talking about this killer, um, uh, J.R. Sorg, and so I had a whole, a whole thing where I'm, I'm talking about J.R. Sorg and how seeing his parents killed or whatever turned him into this, you know, this torturing, killing machine, and of course, you know, Dr. Dan Hess was a psychologist, so, but that's another one of those where people just kind of latched onto that name and go, I want, I want you to play Dan Hess in my movie, oh, and man. again, that was a lot of fun, it was just fun working with, um, Ryan, he had an idea set in his head what he wanted to do, and and then he therefore told me what to do, and and um, yeah, it just came out. It was again, just a, a, you know, a lot of fun to work with and uh, and portray that character. Well, now I, I don't know. A lot of listeners don't know this, but you were also, um, I guess, you were scheduled to be in the movie A Hundred Tears. Yeah, A Hundred Tears. I was originally um, Marcus Cook actually. Uh, well, he told me for the longest time, shortly after Rot, he wanted to redo Rot, and he wanted to um, he wanted me to shave my head bald, which I was always like, I don't know, it's getting bald enough without me chasing it down there. But um, so it was off and on about Rot, and then all of a sudden, he called me one day, and he goes, I'm doing a movie called The Hundred Tears, and we want you to play the clown in it. And I went, um, okay, and the budget was, they had a decent budget, they offered me quite a bit of money, but at the time I was working my job, so it's kind of like, can I work this into my vacations and weekends and then, you know, back and forth. And then I actually went over to uh, where him and Joe Davidson were staying and they already made a poster up and put Joe Davidson on one side and Joel Wankup on the other. And they said one of the guys that gave him the money was in Germany and that guy in Germany told them on the phone, he said, have you really got Joel Wankup in this movie or did you just stick his name on there? And this is what I like about our business, whether you're you're rich and you got all the money in the world doing these movies or you just you don't have it and you have to keep struggling nobody can ever take away from me the movies I've done well this is a guy in Germany that likes my work he likes me in Crete and he and it was one of the things too this is how I understood it getting the money is if I was in the movie and I always wondered if it, maybe that's why there's a newspaper clipping because I couldn't take the picture I, I didn't I, I didn't want to leave my job I was like I can't I mean I, I'm not now because I left my job three years ago just to pursue the acting, but 100 years would have been probably four years ago. And I asked Marcus, is there any way, you know, to do this on weekends? Because no, we got to do every day, and it was 13 days. And, and then I talked to Jack later on after he took the role, because I said, just get Jack Amos then, because I can't do this. Uh, Jack told me it ended up being 16 or 17 days, almost 24 hours. And, well, which is fine, I'll hang in there and work. But I, I just, I was like, you know, I said, I, I just don't think I should quit my job. I better not. Right. And shortly after that, I you know I did leave my job, but yeah, Hundred Tears was pretty much basically they wanted me to be the clown. Marcus kind of wrote it for me, you know, to play that character. He wanted me to play, you know, since Rot, and um, I just couldn't do it because of uh, because of my job. But it was cool to hear that German investor said is Joel Weinkup in it because um, that that's what I'm interested in. Right. And then I don't know what transpired after that with between him and them because they made the movie. But I thought it was kind of cool because they, they have a scene in there when the guy's going through a newspaper. It says something about the Kentucky cannibal craze killers on the loose again. And it was a picture of me in the newspaper. So <laughs> that was kind of neat for them to do that. But yeah, that was that was something that it would have been cool to have portrayed that. I think Jack did an awesome job. I think I could have brought something you know different to the way I would have done it. I mean, either way, there's no dialogue. But there's a lot you can do with without talking. There's facial expressions, body movement, and stuff like that. So. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah, I interviewed Jack Amos, and he mentioned to me that you were originally scheduled to play the killer clown. But uh, Yeah. And, and Jack Jack is an awesome guy. I met Jack, I think, through the Florida Motion Picture TV Association back in 2000, well, 2002 maybe. And we have been off and on on television commercials, uh, infomercials, uh, movies, um, shorts. We've done a lot of shorts together. I'd say at least six or seven shorts. We did the 
Florida uh, Free Money for Florida Filmmakers, and we worked a lot with John Matheny, a kind of an independent um, uh, film guy down here in Florida that shoots a lot of shorts. And Jack's just awesome. I, I see him all the time at auditions. I walk through the door, he sees me, and he goes, Hey, Coop! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jack, but Jack's a great guy. Jack and I get along really good. Well, you joined up with Phil Herman in 2008 called Into the Woods. Yeah, Into the Woods, I really did. I didn't do it super a lot, and I try to tell people when they're like, um, oh, we're doing that movie, i got to get that. I'm, I'm like, right away, I go, look, the movie's cool. It's, it's a lot of fun. Into the Woods, it's got Nancy Pelosi in it, and, of course, Phil Herman's in it. It's, it's cool, it's fun. I said, but if you're going to get it just for me, don't. I'm only, I'm not in there that long. I think I'm in there like maybe 10 minutes. And I'm even trying to remember what I did in that now. Uh, into the Woods, I think I was uh, a security guard that's kind of monitoring on these little televisions where the crazy guy is about to escape. And I kind of fill in, the, my wife and I uh, fill in the narrative, kind of telling what the, what the psychopath before he broke out, what all the stuff he did. So it's kind of like a cameo, maybe a little more than a cameo, but it's not like one of my one of my starring roles. It's more of Phil called up and goes, "Look, I really want you to be in this," and I'm like, "Cool, man, thank you, I appreciate it." So we shot our scenes here in Florida and then send them on up to New York. But it's it's, it's a neat movie. I mean, it's, it's it's a cool little movie. Right. Well, in 2009, you're in a movie called Stop Dead. Um, you're with uh, one of the icons of the horror genre and Debbie Rashawn. Yeah, that was cool. That, um, Stop Dead was a movie I did for a, a filmmaker here in town, or in Apopka, and his name is Jason LaCorey, and he's done a lot of stuff. He did, um, well, he did a bunch of stuff before the things I'm going to mention, but I, I didn't know a whole lot about them because I met Jason in 2004 at this thing called Halloween Horror Picture Show. And uh, I gave Jason a copy of Creep, and he goes, well, here, have a copy of my movie. And we became friends because I, I asked him, I go, dude, I said, I'm sorry, man. I said, my name's Joel Weinstein, and he goes, hey, I'm Jason LaCorey. I go, I'm sorry to bother you, dude, but have you got, like, an extension cord I could borrow? And he goes, come on, man, we'll go to my car. And his girl stayed at his table, and I think I called Chris Woods, a friend of mine, or Shelby McIntyre. I said, hey, can you watch my table while I go outside? Because I had all my movies there on VHS. There were no DVDs then. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, we went out in the car, got the extension cord, but that's how I met Jason. And then I did, I did all wrapped up, death plot, indiscretion, and stop dead for him. And yeah, Debbie Rashawn was in it. And the funny thing was, Jason was like, "Oh damn, uh, uh, Dustin Hubbard, dang it, he's gonna beat me with the Debbie Rashawn Joel D. Weintraub connection because he's got you in his movie." Um, 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 oh my gosh, it'll kill me if I forget. Help me find it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a movie I did for uh, Dustin Hubbard. Oh, for Christ's sake. And it had Debbie Rashawn in it. And and the one thing that was really, and this is another thing people you know won't know, they don't know what goes into this. Debbie and I had lines together, and Dustin wrote this mostly complicated script. And I could not get these lines down. I mean, I'd have been in movies with Debbie before, with our movies, with Endangered Species and Out of the Darkness, but never face-to-face -face with her, and here I am face-to-face, -face, and it was cool seeing her, I was excited, and she's gorgeous, and I'm getting to work with her, I could not remember my lines, and I, I killed myself over that, I even shot a little video where I go, I go, Tim, I really apologize to you, man, I apologize to all the people that follow my movies, because I was going to post it, and I don't know what happened to it, I guess I deleted, erased it on video, but uh, I stood there alone after they all left, and I go, God, I'm such an idiot, how can I F that up? <laughs> and um, I mean, I got some of it, but and Debbie was like, "Well, I've got to take the script on onto my chest, and you can read it off me." And I go, "No, I'm not going to do that. I got to get this." So when Jason gave me the opportunity to be in Stop Dead, I said, "That is not going to effing happen." I said, "I'm going to know that damn script, forwards, backwards, left to right, upside down. I will know that damn script." And it turned out funny because I was I'd be with Debbie doing lines, and Debbie would go like, "Oh wait, I effed that up. Let me do that again." And I was like. I am so glad I know this. <laughs> this time, it's my turn. Right, right. <laughs> and, uh, it was, I mean, Debbie's great. She was fine. But it was just, the, on for Christ's sake, I kept messing up. And and Debbie would kind of forget lines or whatever, too, which is natural, which is normal. And But I just said, I said, this is, this is good because 
I'm remembering my lines, and I'm, I felt terrible messing up with her the first time. This time I'm getting it right, and and Debbie and I worked really good. And and Debbie and I had a scene, um, well, I had seen through the whole movie, but one scene was we were in a in an amusement park, and we had to go in the go-kart. And uh, Debbie goes, to Joel, I, I don't do these things. And I go, Debbie, it'll be okay. And she's no really. And I go, no, no, it'll be okay. Stay next to me. I'll walk you through it. So she got in her car, and we kind of raced next to each other for quite a while until I said, you got this? And she's like, yeah. I go, just fly there, break there. You're, 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 you're doing great. She goes, okay. I said, well, let me get this to Kevin up here because we've got to make a scene out of this. And so I you know, kind of blasted it off. And she did great, and we had a lot of fun. We were shooting in an RV, and... Um, it was, it was cool, too, because Jason has a camera on me. He goes, instead of driving to our location, a lot of these teams are driving. So on our way to our drive, Joel, I'm gonna, I am gonna. want you to do lines, so be careful driving. You're doing 55, you know, 60, 70 miles an hour in this RV going down uh, I-4 to our next location. But you got to remember your dialogue, too, and I want you to be talking to everybody and doing your dialogue, but, but also watching traffic. Don't get us killed and... Yeah. And it all worked out. It was um, it was really cool. Uh, uh, one thing we shot, Jason said, "Come racing out of here." And I said, after we shot it the first time, I said, "Did you like that?" And he goes, "Yeah." I said, "I can do that again a lot faster if you want." And he goes, "Are you sure you can handle all these corners?" And I go, "Yeah." And he go, and Debbie would always yell when I get in the the RV. I'd say, "Okay, here we go again, guys. Everybody, hang on." Debbie goes. So oh, why could you have the hands of Debbie Rashad or the life of Debbie Rashad on your hands? I go, Debbie, it'll be fine. But I tore through that whole area, and then we later figured out, Jason said, "Oh my God, I didn't even get anybody through the windows. We didn't need to have everybody in that in the RV." But it all worked out good. It was uh, the motorcycles are chasing us, and I'm racing out of a place, and I had to race between trees and big stumps and holes and pits and lakes in the in the, in oh the ground. Oh my God! And, yeah, but it was really cool, and Jason. I think Jason put a lot of trust in me. He knows I've driven a truck for 20 years. And, uh, you know, I've had my dealings with having to, you know, avert accidents on the road. I've had to make quick turns and 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 knew how heavy the vehicle was and what I could do in the, in the, in the crystal water truck and what I couldn't do. And so when he, he asked me if I could do the RV, I go, I go, this thing? I go, this is nothing compared to the rig I drive. Right, right. Yeah, so that stop dead was a lot of fun. You can see that on Amazon.com to our Hocus Pocus Productions. That's uh, Jason McCord. I would check things. that. I would yeah, definitely check that one out. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was cool. Well, the one that you want to talk about, why we're on here today, but I'm going to put it off a little bit longer because um, I want to get into that one. But I'm going to okay. I'm going to move up to Brain Jacked in 2009. Brain Jacked. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember how I got that. Um, I think. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I was gone when they did the actual auditions, and but I was in touch with Andy Lolino and Andrew Allen of Film Ranch, and um, Andy Lolino had did this short called Filthy, and then Andrew and him had teamed up to make their, their corporation, Film Ranch, and I wrote them, and I said, geez, guys, I said, I missed that because, I can't remember, I don't even remember if I was working there or not, um, no, it wouldn't have been 2000, or maybe 2008, right at the end. But I said, uh, I missed the initial audition. She said, could I meet up with you guys? And they said, oh, definitely. We, we want you in this movie. We'd like to have you for the uh, Dr. Karaps. And I go, great, can we meet somewhere? So we met at, a, I think, a Starbucks or one of those coffee place things. And uh, I went out and did the reading, and they said they liked it. They said, uh, they said I think we, we want somebody younger for the part, though. Then they were like, you, you're definitely good. We really like you, but... Just like I said before, like with me and Jack Amos, you can do the same role, but Jack will do it one way and I'll do it a different way, and Jack might get the role or I might get the role. Well, this was, they liked me, and they called me up and they said, Joel, we don't have you for the uh, Dr. Kraft. We're going to have an actor named Rod Grant do that. And I go, oh, well, that's cool. I said, I know Rod. He's a friend of mine. That's, you know, I think he'd be good at that. They said, but we want you to play this character, Norm Simpkins, which is pretty kind of regular. I didn't get to be wild or anything. And uh, but it was kind of neat because it was just kind of a regular role. It was just two of the kids, the, the the heroes of the movie, run up to me at a car, and and I tell them the best I can do is get them to a police station. And then, but at the end, after the girl gets in the car, you find out I'm also one of the bad guys. And so kind of a again like a cameo, but a little more than a cameo. Right. In, in Brain Jack, but again, 
uh, a lot of fun doing that for, for my scene. I was out there for uh, like a day, I think. In fact, I was in um, Georgia vacationing, and uh, Andrew called me, and he goes, oh, we're going to need you here tomorrow. And I go, oh, Andrew, I told you I wish I was going to be out of town. On this. He goes, well, he goes, you can either come back and be in it, or we're going to have to reshoot it. He goes, I'm not trying to sound mean or anything, but we got to get this movie done. And I go, no, nah. I said, I'll be there Sunday. We'll leave Saturday morning. So I left Georgia, got back after whatever the ride was, because uh, it was way up in the mountains, nine hours or whatever. And the very next morning, I, I was supposed to still be in Georgia, but I came back to be in Brain Jackson shot the very next day. But what was glad I had enough of the mountain air anyway. <laughs> Came home and got in brain jack. <laughs> nice. Now, it was in 2007. It's a short film. It's called A Ludicrous Tale. Oh, okay. Yeah, A Ludicrous Tale is, um, yeah, it was a short. It's about 20 minutes long, and it's by uh, director John Matheny, who again is a, he was actually a school teacher here. He retired and he went into making movies and shorts. He's with the, uh, Florida Motion Picture and TV Association, and um, he called me up and he goes, I really got this uh, character in this short I got called Ludicrous Tale, and I'd really like to have you um, play this character named Leland Morgan, and you'll be the brother of Jack Amos, who's also in Ludicrous Tale, and I go, oh, anytime to work with Jack, definitely, I want to do that, so, um, you know, it's just, 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 just a short, and I just played a character, but the character I played was, uh, like, the other three people were all into these uh, genies and, and and believing these things that are unbelievable. And, and my character, for once, instead of being out of control, was just a level-headed brother that was like, you guys are on crack. This is, this is not going to work. And um, it was a lot of fun to do, but a lot of the reviews I got were uh, the director should have let Wine Coop explode onto the screen and said he pulled, him, pulled the reins in a Wine Coop and didn't let him move anywhere. Because uh, more than a couple times, I would do kind of go off and do my thing, and the director would stop me and go, "You're not going to do that on my movie." And I go, "Okay, <laughs> you're beautiful. <laughs> you can expect that, but whatever." But uh, one one line I did do when two of the characters are leaving the room, there he's going to conjure up a genie to make him a million dollars. And as the two are leaving, I go, "You guys are on crack." And I got it in before he shut the camera down. He goes, "Why did you say that?" And I go. Because that's what people expect me to say in these kind of movies. Because I'm cutting that out, and I told them I'm going. I'm telling you right now, man, don't cut that line out of the movie. And uh, sure enough, he left it in. And when I did get the reviews on that, where it played in town at festivals, everybody says you guys are in crack. I was quoted in that, and <laughs> that was kind of the, the big line for that short. And um, I mean, it, it was it was cool. It was a very cool story. Everything was cool happening in it, but it was just. Usually I'm jumping all over the place, screaming at place, screaming at people, and out of control. And that was one where I was very, very mellow. But yet, you know, a, a different side of wine coop, the calmer side of wine coop. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, you were in another movie with Debbie or Sean. It's called All Wrapped Up in 2007. Now this one looks very interesting to me. That was fun. That was um. Four, I believe it was four short stories. They're all about mummies. And in one of them is a uh, reprisal. I do a character called Swan Song, who is a grim reaper. And he goes after, I think I'm after the soul of this uh, this mummy, if I'm remembering it correctly. And I have to do battle with him. And my um, um, side, uh, my fifth, is a, a magical one that fires lasers out of it. And... And I worked some martial arts into it, and Jason was like, yeah, that's cool, go for it. So that was one character I played in All Wrapped Up, but I also played a security guard in it, along with my wife, we had just cameos. And I had this silly little mustache and goatee put on me. That is really funny. Um, basically, to kill it, my, my wife and I played, we played the other security guard, and we get into an argument uh, about mummies or something, and I'm saying, you know, mummies, like in Johnny Quest, Curse of Anubis, da 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 and I do the music, and... All of a sudden, the bad guy comes in, and, and he's going, hey, and we're going, how did you stay in the building? And my wife's going, I thought you made rounds, you idiot. And I go, don't call me an idiot. You're an idiot. And she goes, no, you're an idiot. And I go, you're an idiot. And he goes, you're both idiots. And shoots us both dead. Uh. And then I also played uh, Professor Ignis. And it was funny because uh, Jason, when he had the, um, I couldn't go to it either. He had the premiere of it. And he goes, he goes, I really wish you could come, Joel, because I made a game out of it. It's called... Uh, find wine coop in the three shorts, and you win a copy of the movie. So people would have to pick me up in three different shorts. Oh, cool, <laughs> cool. 
the way I got um, Professor um, Agnes is I told uh, I told Jason that he had me in going to do Swan Song and he had me playing the security guard and I go, geez, Jason, I said, can you give me another roller? He goes, dude, I can't put you in three of the stories. And I go, why not? They did it to Data in Independence Day. I didn't even know it was I didn't even know it was Fred Spiner until the girl in front of me goes, that's Data. And I go, oh, yeah, it is. <laughs> so he goes, I never thought of that. He goes, I'll put a wig on you. So I, I did, you know, three scenes of that. Well, I'm going to make a uh, uh, major left turn here. You were in a drama short in 2006. It's called Christian Soldiers. What's that about? Yeah, that's, um, uh, who, the Christian Soldiers, that's right. Who did, that was, um, not Mike Hoffman, but his buddy, Richard Sincere. And, um, he goes, Joel, I'd love to have you in this as the torture victim. And I go, what do I got to do? He goes, you're going to be laying at the table. These guys going to be chopping off your body parts. And I go, oh, I'm there, man. That sounds cool. Ugh. And uh, But, yeah, I'm at a warehouse. They had me strapped down to a table. And the two guys are torturing me, and they're asking me for their money back. And I'm, I'm crying. And in the fit of I'm, I'm begging them, you know, please don't cut my hand off. And I'm like, you know, I'll get you the money. I'll get it back to you. And I'm, really, I'm like, crying. And I'm really, you know, I brought all the tears on for real. You know, and I'm screaming, and I'm going, please don't do it, man, bro, come on, bro, give me the money, bro, I gotta give him the money, bro. <laughs> and he takes this big uh, leaf cutter thing or whatever it is, and he puts it up to my finger, and I'm going, no, 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 and he takes my finger off, Jesus. and then I'm screaming again, the blood spurts out of my my finger, and I'm like, I'm going to get the money back, I'm sorry, are you not going to help? Really screaming and crying at the same time, and then... He pulls the other cutter up and just takes my hand, and the scene ends face to black with me just screaming and crying, and yeah, it's pretty intense. <laughs> People that get played at um, in West Palm Beach at the Palm Beach Film Festival, and I would say for that short, played in there with a, I can't remember if they just played that short or another movie, but man, there was like two or three hundred people in that room in that theater, and when that scene came on, people were like screaming and cringing and. And oh, wow. oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Uh-huh. they're screaming at the at the screen and stuff to to leave my character alone because they're torturing me. Jeez, <laughs> now, it was and, pretty gruesome. Gruesome. <laughs> now, is that available anywhere to see? You know what? I don't know. I had to when I was trying to you know look up my old stuff. I found Christian Soldiers. It had an IMDb regular you know regular page. And I, and I moved away from there, so I've never seen Richard Steer again. But I connected it to mine. I went ahead and went down there and added my name to it because I said, well, there it is on the IMDb, but the guy didn't put my name in there, which connected to mine. But I don't know if it's ever been released, if, if he's maybe released a little compilation of his. Um, so it, it'd be interesting to find out. I'd, I'd like to know that myself. Yeah, all right. Well, if you hear anything, you let me know. I, I'll love to see that. My bust. All right, Joel, there's one more. There's another movie here. Excuse me. It's in 2005. It's called Death Plots. What can oh, you yeah, tell that us? Was, that's also by uh, Jason McCoy. That's the first one where we met each other in 2004. I gave him a copy of Creep, and he gave me a copy of one. And he said, he goes, i got to get this guy in a movie, but what do I put him in? And that was it. He uh, had a character named Swan Song, who plays, who is a reaper. And um, I went up to Apopka and uh, played that role of this reaper that tracks down uh, souls that uh, after you're dead, the soul's supposed to go to heaven. Well, some souls don't like to do that. They like to run around to arcades and go look for old girlfriends and do what they want to do. So uh, I played this reaper that had to, you know, put them back in their body. And uh, that was for, uh, again, Jason LaGoria of uh, Hocus Pocus Productions. That was Death Plot, which was, again, one of those. It was a short, and mine was called... Um, uh, Reef South Florida Division, I think, and the whole uh, DVD it was four short stories, and I played Swan Song, was called Death Plot. And again, that was another one of those that was just uh, uh, a lot of fun to do, being the um, uh, getting to uh, play that character Swan Song it was, it was a lot of fun. And then also, uh, uh, you know, there is script and everything, but Jason really let me run with it and really, you know, pull the character out and really make something out of it. So that was a lot of fun. That's that awesome. was around, I think that was around the same time I did, I did a little short called Accidental Memories, for, again, for John Matheny, the same guy I did Ludicrous Tale for, 
uh, pretty normal, nothing, you know, bizarre, no real wine suit there. I was just uh, uh, a guard in the uh, courthouse, and some guy, Mark Nash, is trying to, his character is trying to get out of a lock, lockdown procedure, and basically we're just yelling between the window, and I'm telling him, sir, you got to settle down in there, and, you know, you, we, we've got rules here. Uh, we're temporarily locked down. There's uh, criminals in the building, and we get to secure it before we can let you out of the room. But still, it was it was a lot of fun to do. Kind of a every once in a while, I like to do these normal characters, and and that was one of them. And, and it's a short called Accidental Memory. And a lot of these shorts are on YouTube. Anybody can look up on YouTube, or just go to my YouTube channel, put Joel D. Wine Cook YouTube, and you'll see all this stuff. Oh, cool. Is um, is on there? Yeah. Nice. Is there anything else you want? Is there anything else you want to bring up? Yeah, well, um, Green Roberts from Outer Space was a movie I did back in 2004. It was um, when I came up to do the movie Rock for Marcus Cook. Um, he was talking to a friend of his on the phone, and it was neat again to hear this part of the conversation. Marcus is standing next to me talking to Garland Hewlett, and Marcus's conversation basically goes like this. He says, "He goes, well, I could probably do that, Garland, but right now I'm shooting my movie, and I got Joel Weinzup up here." Well, all of a sudden I hear coming out of the phone, I hear Garland Hewlett say, who I don't know at the time, you have Joel Wycoop up here? And then Marcus replies, yeah, Joel's the star of my movie, Rod. And then Garland replies, do you think he'd do a scene in my movie, Brain Roberts from Outer Space? And Marcus turns to me and goes, this is a friend of mine, Garland, i got to go over tomorrow, i got to go help him with his movies, we got to stop shooting Rod so I can help him. He wants to know if he'll be in his movie. And I go, sure, I'll be in it. So that's why I have a, a cameo appearance in Brain Roberts from Outer Space. Probably a little more than a cameo because I fight a zombie and I use a whole bunch of karate on him and the zombie grabs my neck and just breaks my neck. Damn. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Evil Tales 3, the final chapter in 2003. Yeah, Evil Tales was for Ronnie Cavallini of Fourth Floor Pictures. And basically I played Dr. Dan Hess again. It was kind of a, uh, a thing where there's... Um, Three, there's uh, two police officers and myself, and my wife plays one of the police officers, and we're sitting down in the police station uh, going over this video of this uh, guy that was a killer uh, that killed his wife, and we're just basically discussing it. And the police have brought me in as an expert, again, playing Dan has to you know figure out the, the psychology of the whole killer's mind and everything. And uh, it was a lot of fun to do, too. Unbelievable, man. <laughs> <laughs> this interview is o- this interview is over an hour, and you you got so much stuff. It's very interesting. <laughs> Scary Tales: The Return of Mister Longfellow in two thousand three. Well, I did I did Scary Tales back for um, Michael Austin in two thousand one, mm-hmm. and we lost track of each other. And when we did catch up, he said, "I want you to do this movie called uh, I want you to do the sequel, The Return of Mister Longfellow." And um, I said, "That'd be awesome, man!" So I ended up shooting. Um, well, the Scary Tales back in the, in the past, 2001, but then also Scary Tales Return of Mr. Longfellow. And that was a lot of fun. I really got to develop the character. In the first uh, Scary Tales, he was, Hello, I'm Mr. Longfellow. Would you like to do any of that, sir? Kind of like that. But by the time part two came <laughs> up, I said, Can I bring this character really? Maybe he's from the first one to this one. He's really, you know, come out of the shell. And that became, Hi, Mr. Longfellow. Oh, you did notice that the car is not red. <laughs> it's just dripping with flavor. Um, I had people come up to me, uh, this guy that likes my movies at um, a convention I was at, and he goes, Mr. Wanku, would you, if I call my girlfriend, would you talk to her like Mr. Longfellow? Because she loves you in that movie. And I go, sure. She picked up the phone and said, hello. And I went, oh, Betty, time to get out of bed. And she was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> So that, that, I mean, that stuff came out of scary tales, and I still hear people today where they're just like, they love that movie and they love that character, and that's that's always good. That's always a good thing to hear. So, excellent. Well, we're obviously going to, have, to have a part two. Um, we have a bunch more, um, a lot of newer stuff that I want to have you come back on again that we can chat about. Awesome. And there is going to be a special. Um, podcast later on in August at the end of this month that uh, I'm not going to mention now. You know what I'm talking about. We're going to try and plug the hell out of it. Um, I think it's going to be fun, entertaining. But I do want to thank you for coming on today, spending some time with the gruesome Herzog. But uh, wow, thank you, sir. It's been a, as Mr. Longfellow would say, 
<laughs> you were a great guest, a great uh, person to chat with, and uh, like I said, uh, we'll continue this because there's a bunch more that I'm really interested in, but we'll give a little bit of a time for the listeners to digest because there's a lot more, and uh, I do deeply appreciate you coming on today, and looking forward to our next chat. Oh, thank you, sir, very much. So am I. It'll be awesome. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Joel. You take care. You are welcome, sir. Thank you. Yep, take care. All right. See ya. He served the original blood feast. Raised hell with 2,000 maniacs. Rode wild with she-devils on wheels. And got down with the Gorgor girls. Now, after 40 years, the Wizard of Gore himself, director Herschel Gordon Lewis, returns to tell you a grisly, gory, grim fairy tale about a reality TV show that finally gives viewers what they really want. Win and get rich. Lose and it's off with your arms, legs, or... On the bloodiest show to ever hit your screen. <laughs> Herschel Gordon Lewis is the Uh Oh Show. The all new splatter classic from the legendary Herschel Gordon Lewis, the godfather of gore. The show will start as soon as your pants are dry. See it before you eat. Uh-oh. It's no different than being on a ride that goes upside down and makes you sick. Director John Waters. The Uh-Oh Show delivers the gore and laughs in equal measures. Michael Belinsky, Philadelphia Examiner. The Godfather of Gore is back and bloodier than ever. Tim Anderson, Bloody Disgusting. Mr. Lewis creates his own masterpiece time and time again. Aaron Tellick, Milwaukee Horror Movies Examiner. H.G. Lewis's The Uh-Oh Show literally coats the screen with the red stuff from start to finish. What a bloody ride. Heather Henshaw, Cinema Head Cheese.